Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Tally Potter and I'm a member of the class of 97 and I'm a member of the National Alumni Board. I'm also so proud to say that along with Amy Cohen, class of 83, I'm co-chair of the Brandeis Women's Network. For those of you who don't know, the Brandeis Women's Network is a relatively new organization. Our mission is simple, to foster and build connections between Brandeis women. Since our, since our formation of June of 2019, our network has grown tremendously. We have a vibrant Facebook group of over 1,200 Brandeis alumna and mothers of Brandesians, which you can find by searching Brandeis Women, one word. And we have been thrilled to offer a variety of programming to the entire Brandeis community, such as tonight's pizza making event. Before we hear from Krishna and uh, Rebecca, uh, I have a couple of uh, house uh, housekeeping matters to share. First, um, we'll be reserving time at the end of the discussion if you have any specific questions, but questions about pizza making, um, you can put in, in the Q&A um, um, or in the chat, you can type them in and um, the questions will be answered and addressed um, as soon as um, it's possible. Um, we anticipate that there may be a lot of questions, so we ask that you meet yourselves um, while this is while the session is going on and the questions will be answered um, in order. Um, this event is also being recorded and will be available um, to be viewed um, after the event. And as a reminder, part two of this pizza making event will take place tomorrow evening. And now I'd like to turn this program over to Rebecca Bachman, class of um, 2013. Um, Rebecca is a member of the National Alumni Board and co-chair of BOLD. Um, thank you, uh, Krishma and Rebecca, and turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Tali, and welcome everyone. Um, thank you, Krishma, for being here tonight. A little bit about Krishma. Krishma graduated um, from Brandeis in 2015 and is the founder of the Home Cooking Collective, a community for aspiring home cooks to learn how to make, a deli make delicious food through high quality workshops, guides, and recipes. The Home Cooking Collective focuses on using science and intuition to build a repertoire of technique-based skills and increase confidence in home cooking. The organization offers both private and group workshops ranging from pizza to bread baking to Italian dishes to Indian dishes, Italian dishes, and more. Um, Krishma also provides data analytics consulting services on the side. Um, so very well-rounded Brandeis alum. Um, and I'm delighted to turn it over to her so that she can teach us how to make some pizza. Thanks for being here, Krishma. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to teach this pizza workshop today. I don't know how many of you have made pizza at home, but really excited to go through this over the next couple of days. Um, the recipe that we are going to be working with today is an amazing recipe from uh, Roberta's Pizza in Brooklyn, New York. Um, if you've ever had it before, it's really delicious. It's a thin crust pizza um, and it's made in their really hot wood fired oven. So what they've done is they've taken that delicious pizza and they've turned it into a recipe that you can make at home. And so that's a recipe that you, I've been teaching in classes for a really long time now. It's great for beginners because you kind of learn all of the steps necessary to make pizza, um, but they're really broken down simply. Um, and so as we go through the process, I'll explain all of the science and in intuition so that you can feel really confident cooking at home and making this pizza. So the agenda for today is um, we are going to first start off by mixing all of our ingredients together. Then um, as, after we mix them, we'll let that dough rest and I'll explain why that resting period is happening. During that resting period, I'll also walk through and answer any questions that you have and I'll really explain you know, what this recipe is doing, um, all of the different ingredients and how you can achieve great, a great pizza dough. And then after the resting period, we will knead our dough and form it into pizza balls that will go into the fridge overnight. And overnight, it will de develop a really delicious flavor um, so that it's ready for our baking tomorrow. So that's kind of an overview. And obviously we'll go through each of these steps in detail, um, but to get started, 
Um, the first thing that you can do is, you know, go ahead and make sure that you have all of your ingredients out already. And we are going to measure our ingredients to create this pizza dough. So for our pizza dough, you know, most pizza dough recipes use a combination of flour, water, salt, yeast, and oil. Um, and so that's kind of what we're, we're working with. It's a base of those ingredients. So I will just show you. I have a medium mixing bowl that I'm going to mix all of my ingredients in. Um, and this recipe makes about two 12 inch pizzas. Um, so if you, are, if you like the recipe, you can always you know, double it in the future or have it. But what I'm gonna be showing you is enough dough for two pizzas. So I have my mixing bowl and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by adding my flours into the bowl. Now in the recipe, I've mentioned that, um, you know, you can use either all all-purpose flour or double zero flour. Um, and so you might be asking, you know, what is the difference between these? Can I use one or the other? So you can absolutely use all all-purpose flour. Double zero flour is a great flour. It's an Italian flour that's used and it helps add a little bit more of like a chewiness, a nice crust um, that you typically get when you're eating a pizza, but the all purpose flour on itself, um, it will also do, it will also make a great pizza. So to start, we're going to add our flours into this bowl. So if you have all all purpose flour, um, you're going to be adding um, all of that into the bowl. I'm using a mix of the double zero flour and the all purpose flour. And so if you're following along with me um, directly, that's going to be uh, 153 grams of double zero flour in your bowl, which is about one cup and one tablespoon of flour. And then for the all purpose flour, we have 153 grams of all purpose flour, which is about one cup, a tablespoon and two teaspoons. And all of those measurements should be in the chat so that you can reference them. So again, you can either use can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, if we're using the rate, if we're only using the all-purpose flour, how much flour should it be? So if you're only using the all-purpose flour, um, basically what you're going to do is just, um, if you see in the chat, just use the exact amount of the like double zero flour as all-purpose. So it says 153 grams of double zero flour. So if you're using all-purpose all flour, just add an additional 153 grams of all-purpose flour or um, a cup and um, a tablespoon of all-purpose flour. Does that make sense? So just replace the amount of double zero with all-purpose flour. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. No problem. All right, so we have our two flours in the bowl. So as I mentioned, you're looking for either, um, you know, like your combination of double zero and all-purpose or just the total all-purpose flour. So I have my flours in the bowl and to this, I'm going to add my salt. So first we're gonna be mixing our dry ingredients and then we'll separately mix our wet ingredients together. So for um, this bowl with my flour, I'm going to add my salt. And for the salt, we're gonna need, it's one teaspoon or eight grams of fine sea salt. Now, if you have any other type of salt, like if you only have um, a more in iodized salt, you can also use that, it's totally fine. It doesn't have to be um, a sea salt. Any, any other salt will do. Um, the one thing with salts is that sometimes different salts actually taste saltier. So um, sometimes that will have an effect, but with this recipe, I find you can just use the one teaspoon. I don't, I don't notice any sort of difference between using different types of salts. So again, I have my flowers in my bowl and then I'm going to add, I, I've added my um, salts. And so now I have my dry ingredients ready and I'm going to put that aside. Um, before we go on, Krishma, we've got a question in the chat about yeast. I have SAF red yeast. Is that considered instant? Yeah, um, SAF actually, yeah, it should be instant yeast. It should say on the package, but I'm, I believe that's the one that I have right now. Um, either way, it doesn't matter too much um, as long as it's like kind of, and I can show you what my yeast looks like. Um, we'll be mixing that together, but 
as long as it looks like kind of these smallish particles of yeast, whether it's active, dry, or instant, it's totally fine for this recipe. Um, but the SAF ready should be instant, but it should stay on the package as well. Thank you. All right, so as I mentioned, we have our dry ingredients to the side, and then I'm going to add the, um, I'm going to make a, a mixture of my wet ingredients. So what we're sort of calling as our wet ingredients is we have water, we have yeast, and we have olive oil. So for, um, for this, this mixture, you can either get a bowl or I'm just using the um, mixing jar that I have already. What you're going to do is get 200 grams of lukewarm water. Um, if you don't have a scale, the sort of measurement conversion is about scant one cup, but I would actually I recommend just doing either 200 grams of warm water or 200 milliliters um, on a liquid, liquid measuring cup of water. I found that's the most accurate way. So I have my you know, 200 milliliters, 200 grams of lukewarm water. And to that, I'm going to add my yeast. So again, you can be using active dry yeast, you can use instant yeast. Um, they both work for this recipe. And what you're doing here in this process is you're actually kind of activating your active dry yeast. So by adding your yeast particles to your water, you're activating it and ensuring that it can, you know, proof and rise. Um, with instant yeast, you actually don't have to do this, but for the purpose of like simplifying the recipe, we'll all sort of add these um, yeast, oil, and, and water to this, to this mixture. So again, I have my water here and I'm going to be adding either two grams of active dry yeast, which is about three quarters of a teaspoon, or 1.5 grams of instant yeast, which is just like a little over half a teaspoon. So if you're doing the instant yeast, I would recommend just packing your half teaspoon measure. So I'm going to add my yeast. Seems like my yeast has stuck to my bowl, which is a bit weird. <laughs> But um, I'm going to just mix. Do you know how much water it is? Yeah, so the water is um, 200 grams of lukewarm um, water. So just not, not super hot, but just like a little bit above room temperature um, or 200 milliliters. Did you say half a teaspoon of instant yeast? Uh, yeah, half a teaspoon of instant yeast. Okay, thanks. Awesome. So I've got my 200 grams or 200 milliliters of water. I've got my yeast in this measuring cup um, and I'm just mixing it together again. So like with active dry yeast, this is how you're actually activating it. Um, and then I'm going to add my olive oil as well to this mixture. And so for my olive oil, it's either four grams of olive oil or one teaspoon of olive oil. So I'm just going to, again, mix this together to make sure it's fully incorporated. And, um, you know, I know I've been talking about measurements and with measuring cups, I've been talking about scales. The thing with baking is that it's just a little bit more accurate when you use a scale. Um, and so I highly recommend if you get into pizza making, if you get into bread baking, it can be really helpful to have a cheap scale. The one I have is, was about $10. Um, and so that can help you have the most accurate uh, measurements to really ensure that you're achieving the exact thing that the recipe developer intended for. Um, but if you don't, totally fine. You can use measuring cups. Just that would be an in interesting thing to sort of note is you know, if you get more into bread baking, having a scale can be something that's really, really helpful. So to recap, I have my wet ingredients. I've got my lukewarm water, I've got my yeast, and I have my olive oil um, in my liquid measuring cup. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix my uh, wet ingredients into my dry ingredients. And the best way that I think to do this, to really ensure that everything kind of mixes homogeneously is I like to form, I can show, I like to form a bit of a well in the center of the bowl. 
So it doesn't have to be a perfect well, um, but I just kind of like to form, you can see I've created this well and inside the well, I'm going to add my liquid ingredients. So now you can see most of my liquid is in this well. And what I'm going to do is use a spoon and just gently mix the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients. And so I find that forming a well and having the liquid be separated makes it a little bit easier to ensure that I don't get um, you know, massive dry bits. So what we're doing right now is we're mixing mixing our wet ingredients into the dry just until the dough kind of comes together. It'll look shaggy, it'll be sticky, um, which is totally fine. It's going to continue to kind of hydrate as we let it rest. Um, but the key is to just make sure um, that you don't have any really big clumps of dry bits af after um, kind of mixing this dough together because um, those kind of are a little bit harder to get out later. Um, but really what you're looking for is something that's shaggy um, and it'll be a little bit sticky. So once I've kind of mostly started to mix and incorporate my, my wet ingredients into my dry, I like to switch to my hands. Um, you don't have to if you, you know, would prefer you to use a spoon, but I find it a little bit easier to really incorporate the flour into the rest of the liquid and get rid of those dry bits. So what I'm doing is I'm essentially just taking a corner of the dough, lifting it up and then folding it over into the center. And I find that that helps really bring the dough together. So you're not kneading here, you're really just mixing the ingredients together until you get somewhat of a homogeneous mass of dough. And this should probably take you, you know, anywhere from two to three minutes before your dough is kind of that, that shaggy, sticky, homogenous texture that you're looking for. Um, and I'll show you as well what, what my dough looks like when it's done. Karishma, can you remind the group if you're using all-purpose flour, um, what the quantity is? Yeah, so if you're using the all-purpose flour, I would just recommend um, basically, you can, you can just substitute the amount of double zero flour, so like the one cup plus a tablespoon with an equivalent one cup of, uh, and one tablespoon of all-purpose flour. So it's going to be two cups, two tablespoons, and about two teaspoons. And the thing about like making pizza dough especially is that, you know, we're all using different flours and, you know, different flours have different rates of absorption of water. And so everyone's dough, like even if you're using kind of the exact same ingredients, sometimes look a little bit different. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of assess at each stage that we are kind of making this dough, you know, does it look like I expect to? And if not, do I need to adjust it? So um, you know, start with those measurements and then we'll take a look and I can answer any questions if people, you know, are concerned about their dough at all at any point. Is there any risk of overworking the dough at this stage? Uh, that's a great question. There, no, I wouldn't worry about it. So the reason that we're sort of doing a quick mix and then we're letting the dough rest for about 15 minutes is that um, in that time, we're going to like kickstart some gluten formation, which I'll talk about. If you end up kind of like over mixing, doing some kneading now, it's totally fine. It's actually, um, the real thing is like, sometimes you need a little bit of time for your dough to rest and relax before you can knead it really fully. So nothing will really happen if you overwork it at this point. It's, I mean, it's really hard to do that. Um, if anything, it might start resisting you and you'll say, okay, I feel like it's time for my dough to rest. So no worries on that. All right, so I have my dough and you can see it is 
quite sticky. It's sticking to my hands, totally normal. It's not like very wet at all, but it is sticking to my hands. I'm getting some of the dough on my hands and it's fully incorporated. So I'm not feeling any dry clumps or bits as I, as I kind of touch and feel the different parts of the dough. So my dough is now ready to rest. So I'm going to keep it in my bowl and I'm going to keep my bowl covered for this 15 minute period to let it rest. Um, you can use either plastic wrap, you can use any sort of lid or container or tea towel, just something to cover your dough so that it doesn't dry out. Um, and if anyone has questions on what exactly this looks like, I'm also happy to show it to you again as you're working through your dough. But, you know, essentially you're really looking for something that is shaggy. It's going to be a little bit sticky, but you're not seeing any huge clumps of dry bits. And the reason that, you know, we are letting this dough rest, as I mentioned, is when you incorporate your water into the flour, the flour starts to hydrate. And sometimes, you know, that takes a little bit of time. And so if you start kneading your dough now, um, you'll notice that it'll actually look and feel differently than after the rest period. So there's a couple things that the rest period does. It hydrates the dough, which means it's quite sticky now, but in 15 minutes, it'll look smoother and it'll look softer. And the second thing is that it kickstarts gluten formation. So with your flour, there's kind of two proteins um, that help kind of form a gluten matrix. And when you add water to your flour, it first starts off as this very, again, it's this like shaggy mix. Um, and these proteins are just kind of arranged randomly. But as you start kneading your dough, as your dough starts resting, as that water hydrates, it forms this kind of interconnected matrix, which is this like these nice gluten bonds, which is what creates a really nice dough. So that's what gives you a chewy crust. Um, you know, that's what gives you like this nice airy crust is that gluten formation. So letting the dough rest kind of kick starts that period um, so that if, you know, once you need, your actual need time after that period is shorter than if you had just started kneading your dough now. So we're essentially kind of saving you time and effort by letting your dough sit, kick starting this gluten formation so that when you need your dough, you only have to knead it for a few minutes. Um, so I see there's a couple of questions. There are a couple of questions in yeah. the chat box. Um, first question is, can I add dry seasoning like garlic powder or basil to the dough? That's a really good question. So I haven't done that myself. Um, my only concern with adding seasonings like that to the dough would be that when it goes into the oven, they could burn. But I mean, I've, I've definitely made like a focaccia dough, for example, with different dried herbs. So, you know, if you want to experiment with it, definitely go ahead. Um, you know, and I know that there's like, I'm thinking about like a, like a Domino's pizza crust or something definitely has seasonings in it. So I haven't tried it myself, but I definitely recommend any sort of experimentation that people are into. Another question, if you want to make Sicilian pizza instead of thin crust, how would you modify the recipe? Okay, that is a great question. So I think that will bring me into the different styles of pizza dough. So the dough that we're making today, as I mentioned, it's kind of this recipe from Roberta's and their dough is like a wood fired, crispy, thin crust pizza. So their dough that we're making today is a mix between a Neapolitan style dough, which is like that very classic Italian dough, a really bubbly crust, charred bubbles. It's really like moist inside and you have to almost cut it with a fork and a knife. Um, and then New York style, which is like a little bit uh, crispier, a little bit crunchier, um, and you can pick it up and you know eat it with your hands. So that's like the mix between this dough. So the Sicilian dough, for example, um, is a little bit different in that, first of all, it's like baked in, you know, I have actually a pan, it's baked in like a rectangular baking pan. Um, it's a thicker crust, it's an airier crust. So for a Sicilian crust, for example, what I typically do is I would use something like a focaccia dough recipe. Focaccia recipes, um, they're similar in the sense that they use more water. So this dough, again, is like, we're really trying to get a thin crust. It's a little bit crispy. With Sicilian, we're looking for something that has, it's like 
thicker. And so like we want more moisture when it goes into the oven. Um, so I don't have a modification for this particular recipe, but um, you know, either today or tomorrow, whenever we send out an email, I'm happy to send um, a focaccia recipe that you could use as like a base for a Sicilian pizza. So this question isn't in the chat, but I think that it would be awesome if you could share a little bit more about the Home Cooking Collective and why you started it so that yeah. everyone can, can learn more about what you do aside from leading um, us in this awesome workshop. Yeah, absolutely. So I started cooking about 15 years ago. I was like 12 years old and I didn't really have anything to do one summer. Um, and so I started watching Food Network and I started really getting into cooking. And so I, you know, during the pandemic, I kind of was evaluating how much I had learned in that like, you know, 15, 14, 15 years. And I realized that a lot of my cooking learnings were through trial and error. So, you know, I would approach, for example, like a pizza recipe and I would make it over and over again and try to learn why is my pizza failing? Why is it ending up kind of like, why is it too crackery? You know, why is it too crunchy? Why is it dried out? Why isn't it more moist? All these questions that I would ask myself, I would learn through trial and error. And I realized that I felt like this isn't the most efficient way to learn how to cook. And there's so many like delicious recipes that I think are more intimidating, like pizza or different types of bread making or, you know, Indian cooking, where I felt like, well, what if I created guides that and workshops that really walked through all of these sort of um, you know, techniques and explained, you know, what a recipe is doing and why it's doing that so that, you know, folks at home can feel confident cooking on their own. They can feel confident riffing um, and experimenting. So that was kind of the idea for the Home Cooking Collective is um, really breaking down recipes into like a set of techniques based on science and intuition. What is your favorite thing to make? Oh, of all time? Oh my gosh, wow, that's a really good question. Um, well, I feel like in the last year, if I didn't say pizza, it would be kind of sad because I've probably made over a hundred pizzas, um, maybe more than that, maybe like 150, 200. But what I guess, I think, I don't know if this really counts as like a food, but what I realized at the end of the day is what I really actually love making is I love just going into my fridge and finding ingredients and making a delicious dinner at home. I feel like that to me is really, really satisfying more than kind of, um, you know, making something that's like super complicated, just making something that's like simple and delicious at home. Awesome. Um, another question in the chat. Do you have a flour suggestion for a gluten-free crust? Oh, that's a great question. So I have not worked myself with um, gluten-free um, ingredients, but um, I'm also happy to send uh, a suggestion from somebody else's blog that has some sort of a, a gluten-free ingredient, but definitely gluten-free crusts are tougher, but I know that there are good recipes online. So I'm happy to send over a link too. Awesome. Um, another question in the chat, um, what, so this is day one where we're making the dough and learning about that process. And then day two, tomorrow, actually making the pizza and going to be able to eat it. What should people do? I know that you're, we're gonna go through more here, but just so people start thinking about what they need to have ready um, supply wise for tomorrow. Can you share that? Yeah, sure, yeah. So for tomorrow, um, I can go through it again later, but basically you're going to need something that you can cook your pizza on. So what we're trying to do, um, and what I'll also kind of emphasize as we're going through this is, as I mentioned, like, you know, a lot of restaurant pizza ovens cook at a much higher temperature, like a wood fired oven is 900,000 degrees. Even a New York style oven is a little bit higher than like a home oven, which only gets to about 500 550 degrees max. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to set ourselves up so that we have something that we can put our pizza on that's preheated, that's really hot so that we can get our oven as hot as possible. So in terms of what equipment you can use, um, obviously, you know, if you have like a pizza stone or I use a baking steel, which is like a 
really thin, really heavy piece of metal that um, gets a ton of heat on it. You can, that would make the most sense for pizza. Um, but you can also bake your pizza on top of a large baking sheet as well. Um, or you can bake it on top of a cast iron pan. And for the, either the cast iron pan or the baking sheet, what I recommend doing is you're gonna essentially preheat your oven for regardless, whatever equipment you want, you're gonna preheat your oven for um, at least 45 minutes before our class starts so that it gets really, really hot. And as you're preheating your oven, what you're gonna to wanna to make sure is that you have whatever piece of equipment you're baking your pizza oven, that's in the oven preheating with it. So if you're using a baking sheet, you're gonna to wanna to put your baking sheet in upside down um, on the middle rack of your oven so that it preheats with your oven and gets really, really hot. Um, same with your cast iron pan, same with your pizza stone or your baking steel. So any sort of like, you know, flat surface that you have or something really hot, like a cast iron, anything that can get really hot in the oven is really important. And then what we'll do is your oven's preheated, the equipment that you're gonna cook it on is preheated. We will, you know, take our dough out, we'll stretch our dough, we'll top our dough, um, and then we will, you know, put it on directly on top of this equipment in the oven so that, again, your pizza is going into a really hot oven on top of a really hot piece of equipment. Now, um, you know, I have, for example, like a pizza peel, which is, I will show you, but I have like a, a wooden pizza peel or a metal pizza peel. Um, this is a, a device that you can use to slide your pizza in the oven. So I would build my pizza on top of this peel and then shimmy my pizza onto my equipment. Um, but if you don't have that, you can absolutely use parchment paper. That's what I recommend. So you basically build your pizza on the parchment paper directly. And so then that really allows you to then just very easily transfer it with the parchment on top of your baking sheet, your baking seal, whatever you're using. So um, basically having something that can get really hot in the oven that you can bake your pizza on, either having a pizza peel or some parchment paper, um, and then obviously having, um, you know, whatever toppings that you want to use, that's also kind of the key pieces of equipment. Um, one other question in the chat, is a pizza pan with holes in it good? Yeah, so that's a good question. So when you use like a pizza pan with holes, it doesn't get as, um, it's a little bit, first of all, it's a little bit trickier to kind of like preheat and transfer your pizza to it. Um, if you have a peel or if you feel comfortable just like putting your parchment paper on your, on this pan, that's totally fine. So I would say that it, it works, um, but it doesn't get as hot as some of the other pieces of equipment that I mentioned. But if that's all you have, it's totally fine. I've had people make great pizzas with it. Awesome. All right. Um, and then the, the other piece that I'm going to talk about is, you know, I mentioned temperature, right? So typically some of these pizzas that you get at restaurants are cooked in a really hot oven. We're trying to mimic that um, at home. But so like temperature is a really, really big thing. Um, the other thing that we're doing, which I haven't really talked about, is that is the fact that we're going to be putting our pizza in the fridge overnight. So you may have followed um, a recipe in the past where you make your pizza dough on the same day and it's ready on the same day to bake. This is obviously a different recipe, right? It's sitting in the fridge overnight. So what's happening there? So when your pizza is sitting in the fridge overnight, because it's at a lower temperature, we're actually slowing down the amount of time it would take for your yeast to like double and therefore for your dough to rise. And why we do that is that by slowing down this period, we're allowing the dough to get more and more flavor. Um, and so you'll notice um, for a same day dough versus you know this 24 hour dough, or even if you've had like a sourdough pizza, that longer time that your dough is sitting and is in the fridge, um, it's getting more flavor um, and, and it's also getting a little bit better of a texture. You're gonna get a better crust from that. So that's, that's kind of why we're doing this overnight dough. And you know, I have a recipe actually for a 48 hour dough or a 72 hour dough. It lets you kind of do a longer dough period. Um, and so you can really play around with this. You don't have to do 24 hours. You can do a longer period. 
Um, but conversely, if you ever wanted to, for example, make a shorter dough, really the thing that you have to think about is temperature and then the amount of yeast that you have. So if you have, um, basically for a, for a dough that's sitting in the fridge longer, you're gonna use a smaller amount of yeast at a lower temperature to really slow down that process. Um, for a same day dough, you might use like two or three or four times the amount of yeast to get your dough to double so that it's ready to use in that time. Cool. All right, so I think my dough has been sitting for just about 15 minutes. Um, I'm just gonna quickly wash my hands and then I'll come back and show you how to knead the dough. All right. So my dough has been sitting and you can see that in this time, it's not really sticking to me as much and it's smoothed out a lot and it's softened up. So we are going to knead our dough. And like I mentioned, this kneading period is much shorter than if you had just kind of started kneading it from the beginning because we let it rest. So you can just knead it um, on your, uh, like on any sort of work surface, a wooden um, cutting board or like a wooden board is best for kneading dough actually because it absorbs moisture really well. And so it's gonna act a little bit less like sticky, um, but you can also just use your countertop. So just in terms of kneading your dough, um, if you find that your dough is feeling quite sticky, it's sticking to the board, you can always take a little bit of flour. You don't wanna use too much, but you can take a little sprinkle or so and just sprinkle your board down so that your dough doesn't stick to it. But in terms of kneading, um, the way that I like to do it is I like to just kind of put the dough down and pick up the corner of the dough that's farther away from me and just fold it over and then stretch the dough. I know we've got a few questions about kneading. Yeah. Um, can I knead on parchment paper is one question. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've never done that before. You, it, I don't, I, you might have trouble like if it's rolling around. Um, it might be just easier to do it directly on like your counter or something, but um, you can definitely try that. Um, but I feel like it might kind of, the parchment paper might roll around if you do that. Um, then another question, how about using a KitchenAid with a dough hook? No, that's a good question. Yeah, so you can also use a KitchenAid mixer um, for sure. And if you were doing that, I'd probably need at like medium speed for maybe like five minutes. Um, at the end of this kneading process, your dough should be completely smooth. It should be quite soft. Um, one thing I would say is that I, I like prefer to actually use my hands to knead and work with the dough. And the reason for that is that I find that it's easier to then learn kind of exactly what texture I'm looking for um, if I'm able to really play with it and see it. And I can see it sort of change over time. Um, but totally, if you wanna use a KitchenAid mixer, absolutely you can. Um, another question, are there any store-bought ready-made doughs that you think are like that you recommend in a pinch if you don't have time to make your own pizza dough? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually buy the Whole Foods pizza dough quite a bit. Um, and the one thing I would say about that dough and maybe other pizza doughs is that just what you're gonna wanna do is you're just gonna to make sure that um, if you're trying to make, for example, like a, pe like a pizza dough that's 12 inches, some of those doughs um, are like come in huge quantities. So the whole foods dough, I think is like, it might even be more weight than like these two pizzas, pizza doughs combined. Um, and so I would just like make sure how much like weight there is. So typically for like a 12 inch pizza, you're looking for dough that's about 230, 240 grams. Um, and so if you notice like on when you buy your dough, it'll say like the number of grams. So just like divide it into that number. Um, and then I recommend actually like re-balling the dough into the each individual pizza doughs um, and letting that actually sit at room temperature. Because what I find with um, 
like the whole foods dough, for example, is I really like the flavor and I really like the crust, but sometimes it's really hard to stretch out. It doesn't feel relaxed. Um, and so you end up with this like really big poofy crust in a small pizza. So letting um, your pizza dough like sit at room temperature, especially if you reball it, will allow like that gluten to relax and allow it to come back to room temperature. We've got another um, question or statement from Michelle Letter. Um, my dough ball looks a lot smaller than yours, even though I used a scale. Um, Michelle, I invite you to, if you're not already on video, feel free to um, show your pizza dough on video so that Karishma can. Yeah, I'm happy to take a look. Also, I do have really small hands, so I don't know if that's creating some perception of it, but I can take a look. Yeah, Michelle, I think that looks, I think that looks right. I think my hands are just like, they're, they look really small in this camera and I also have small hands. Um, I think you're fine. This is actually, it is pretty small. Like you can see it fits in the, almost like the palm of my hand. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so you can see I'm sort of, once I get closer to like, and I see that the ball is getting a little bit smoother, what I like to do is I just kind of like roll um, with my palm, I just roll the dough back and forth, um, which kind of helps smooth it out. It's, I'm still kneading the dough, but it's not as harsh as like a stretching method. So I like to stretch in the beginning and then towards the end, just kind of roll the dough back and forth. Another question about kneading. If the dough is sticking to my hands as I'm kneading it, can I add more flour? Yes, so if you, you can sprinkle a little bit of flour on your board and you can sprinkle a little bit of flour on your hands if the dough is sticking. Um, and so hopefully that helps. As I mentioned, like depending on the flour that you're using, depending on the measurements, sometimes it's not like exactly, um, you know, exactly the same. So definitely if your dough is feeling really sticky at this point, you can add a little bit of flour at a time as you need it. All right, so I can see that my dough is, you know, quite smooth and it's very soft. Um, so, you know, if I have my dough ball, I'm almost done kneading. I'm just going to kind of very um, gently shape it into a ball. We're going to cut this in half and form them into balls, so it doesn't need to be perfect, but just sort of um, so that it's kind of in one, um, you know, homogeneous circular mass so that we can cut it. Um, again, it should feel smooth at this point. It should feel soft and it shouldn't be sticking to your board. So, you know, I, I'm leaving mine on my board and it's not sticking. Um, so that's how you know it's done. And if it is sticking, you can add a little bit of flour at a time to knead it in. The other thing is like the more you knead the dough, the more your dough is getting exposed to the air. So it's gonna naturally dry out um, as you work with it as well. So you can always just like wait a minute or so if it's feeling just a tad sticky, you can knead for another minute or so or just kind of like let it sit um, and it, it will get a little bit less sticky. But if you need to use flour, um, absolutely you can use a little sprinkle of it. So, um, hopefully people are feeling pretty good about their dough. It's looking, you know, it's looking smooth. Um, if there are, if there are questions before we ball it, I'm happy to answer those. One other question. Does it matter if I add the bread flour or the all purpose flour? Uh, like if you're adding more flour. Um, so what I would say is, is basically maybe just use like a half uh, and a half and half. So if you're only adding like a tablespoon or so, it doesn't really matter which one. But if you find that you're adding a little bit more, maybe just add, make sure that you're adding kind of equal amounts to sort of stay true to that ratio of half and half. There are no other questions in the chat. You've answered them all. Okay, awesome. And what I will say as well is that, um, you know, the more you kind of like get used to and work with the dough, the it, it also just like ends up feeling less sticky. It's a little bit easier for you to handle. Um, and I actually have a story of somebody that they made this pizza dough the first day with me. And 
they were so nervous about their dough because it felt sticky. So they ended up making another batch. And the next day when we made the pizza dough, their family and that they loved the stickier dough. So part of it is like, you know, I wouldn't feel too nervous about um, stickiness. It's okay if there's like a little bit of it. Um, you don't want something that feels really, really wet and is sticking all over, but also stickiness is just kind of, there's nothing that inherently bad about it more than it's just harder for you to handle. So I think like adding flour for you to be able to handle it is totally fine. Um, but also just that you shouldn't be nervous that like, you know, the recipe is not going to come out perfectly. Don't worry about that. Your dough is going to come out great regardless. Okay. Awesome. So hopefully people are feeling pretty good. The last step um, is to ball your dough. So again, we have this ball of dough and I'm going to divide it into two pieces, which is going to make two 12 inch pizzas tomorrow. So I have like a bench scraper, which by the way, I really love this. It's really great to scrape up any bits of dough. It's great to divide dough, but you can also really easily use a knife. Um, so I'm just going to divide my dough in half. If you have a scale, you can be really precise and divide it into two equal portions um, as well, or you can just eyeball it. So I'm just going to take one half. And as you can see, you know, this, this is not a, a circular ball of dough. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to kind of like shape it into a rough uh, sphere again. And then we're going to really make sure when we're balling our dough, the biggest thing is to make sure that you are creating tension that keeps like the gas bubbles from the yeast inside of this dough. So if you were to just, for example, very loosely ball up your dough, what happens is that those um, air bubbles that are created by the yeast can sort of escape. They don't have anywhere, they're not trapped. And so your dough can sort of like flatten out. But if you create this nice tension, which I'll show you, what happens is, you know, you get this, these nice bubbles that stay in the dough. Um, and then when you stretch out your pizza dough and you bake it, you, you get those, that nice, um, you know, brown bubbles that you would traditionally associate with pizza. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my kind of long blob of dough and I'm gonna kind of take each, you can see there's the, imagining that there's maybe like four corners. I'm just gonna bring the corners into the center so that I form um, a, a like somewhat of a circle. Um, and again, we're gonna be doing a couple different ways of kind of getting into a circle, but generally you wanna form it into a rough circle. So I'm gonna grab my ends and bring them to the center and then grab my other two corners and bring them in. And as I'm bringing these corners in, I can start getting a little bit more precise of bringing any sort of, like you can see that there's this um, crevice here. I wanna make sure again that the ball is tight, it's smooth. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm kind of actually creating a pouch. Um, and so I'm just bringing any sort of um, kind of gaps here, bringing them to the center, the top of the dough um, and creating this pouch. And I can start sealing the top of the pouch. And again, you can see I'm, I'm pinching any of these kind of corners to the top to create this pouch. Um, and then I'm kind of rotating it in my hand to make sure that I've kind of sealed this dough ball as well as possible. So it's kind of like, uh, if you, I've never made mozzarella, but I'm told that this is like a similar process. Um, and what you can notice here is like all of that weight of that dough is sort of held and there's like this kind of gravity and tension so that I know that all these gas bubbles will stay in my dough. So I have my pouch and then what I'm going to do is I can see I have like kind of a little flap here from the pouch that I created. So I'm just going to tuck it in ensuring again that all of these corners are sealed. And then I'm gonna turn my dough over so that I have the smooth side on top. Um, and I'm going to essentially take my two hands and I'm going to rotate and cup the dough with my hands. So what I'm doing is I'm basically, if you see with one hand, I'm taking my pinky finger and I'm essentially moving and rotating my hand so that the dough, my fingers go under the dough and rotate it. So by doing this, I'm also creating some tension. So I'm just basically taking my hand 
put my pinkies are barely under the dough. Um, they're grazing the dough and it's rot and I'm rotating it. And my other hand is kind of going in the other direction and rotating. So the easiest way to do it is just to start kind of, again, taking your two hands and cupping the dough while rotating it. Um, and then if you get kind of more comfortable with this cupping rotation, you can then bring your pinky fingers and make sure that it really gets under the dough to, to kind of seal and create that tension. And then I just have my dough ball. So we can see that it's nicely sealed. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a container uh, loosely kind of coated with olive oil, which prevents it from sticking with, when it's in the fridge. And in terms of containers that you can use, so you can see I have this kind of like circular, it's just a Tupperware container um, that, I'm, that I'm going to be putting my dough in. You can use anything like this circular container. Um, you can use like a bowl like this that you cover with plastic wrap. You can use, for example, like if you had a, um, like a dough proofing box, you could use that. I have like a nine by 13 pan. You can also put your dough in here. Um, the, old, the one thing I would say is that what happens is that your dough really expands to conform to the container. So my dough is going to expand um, to conform to this circular container. So for example, if you're using a, um, you know, like a square Tupperware, your dough will turn into a square. And because we're trying to keep it into a circle, um, it's easier to use like a circular container or a large enough container um, what, like this, where my dough is not gonna um, conform as much and it's just gonna spread out. Um, for oil, you just really wanna make sure that you use enough. You can be more generous here. Um, so I probably use, like I would use probably like at least, at least like a teaspoon or so. Um, and you wanna make sure that you generously uh, oil the bottom as well as the sides of the container so that because the, your dough is going to expand. Um, but you wanna make sure it's really, really well coated. I would say like, yeah, you can go more generous on oil here because it's the worst thing to have your dough stick. Um, and the other thing about containers is that, again, your dough is gonna probably expand and double. So you wanna make sure that your dough has enough room to expand. If your container is too small, like if your container, for example, is the size of the dough right now, um, it can expand out of the container and um, kind of like explode out. So just make sure that you have enough space for your dough. Another question, if yeah. you're going to freeze one of the two dough balls, um, should that be done now or the day after rising? Oh, that's a good question. So I would recommend um, actually doing the day of rising first um, and then freezing your dough on the second day once it's fully risen so that when you take your dough out of the freezer, all it has to do is then come back to room temperature. Um, I will say that free sometimes freezing your dough can, can kind of change like the texture of it, um, but I've definitely done it before. And so, yeah, I would just recommend letting your dough rise that first day in the fridge and then doing the freezer. So I have my second dough ball here and you can see again, I'm forming that pouch. Um, and if anyone has questions about like the balling process, definitely let me know. Again, the key here is to make sure that your dough is sealed as much as possible um, so that it stays this really nice um, ball. It'll stay, then stay as a circle when you stretch it out um, and you keep those nice air bubbles. And um, as I said before, you know, definitely go more generous with oil um, than you might than you might think, just in case. Um, because again, the whole point that we're doing is we're really trying to, um, you know, make sure that our our dough ball stays intact. 
And so if it does stick when you're pulling it out, you can lose some of that air um, and you can lose some of that shape of the dough. Um, I see a question about showing the balling process again. So I will do that. Um, this dough is a little bit oiled, but I think it should be fine. So essentially what we're doing is we're first taking our, our piece of dough and we're making sure that it forms a circle. So, um, you know, again, I'm gonna grab sort of the corners, the four first four corners of the dough. And so I start kind of, now I'm feeling it's like holding like a pouch. And then I'll go around and grab any sort of other crevices of that dough and seal them together into the pouch. Um, it's a little tougher to show it just because it already has the oil on it, but um, your dough should pretty seal pretty easily. So you can see that I have kind of this pouch and then once you have the pouch, you're gonna seal the dough and press it down. And then you're going to do this rotation process, um, which again involves taking both of your hands and first just kind of taking each hand and rotating the dough, which helps form it into that circle. And as you're doing this, if you're able to get your pinkies under this dough, that also really helps seal and keep in that tension. And then you have your dough ball. Um, okay. Oh, Another yeah. question, if I refrigerate it for more than one day, does it improve flavor? Okay, so this is a good question. So this depends on, so the answer is yes, but you want to be careful about refriger refrigerating your dough for more than one day, depending on the recipe that you're using. So as I mentioned, um, when you when you use like a recipe and if it's intended for a certain amount of time, that means that they're using a certain amount of yeast. So with this recipe, for example, um, if you leave it in the fridge for more than 24 hours, um, sometimes it can get like a little bit too like acidic from the yeast um, or it can overproof. And so um, if you were wanted to, for example, refrigerate your dough for more than one day, you would wanna use like a lesser amount of yeast. Um, and that's also why, for example, like if you were making a same day pizza dough and you were using, you know, like three tablespoons of yeast, for example, if you put that in the fridge for three days, it would taste really, really sour from the yeast and it would probably overproof. So you always really wanna like be able to control the amount of yeast and then the time that you're sort of keeping it in the fridge. Awesome. Any other questions? So basically you're just going to, um, your, your dough balls should be nice and um, covered. Um, you don't want, you know, any air to get in because it'll dry it out. You're going to stick those in the fridge and then tomorrow, and I have more detailed instructions in the recipe document, but tomorrow hey. before class, oh. Why are we? Because I'm listening. Hey, what just happened? Did somebody have a question? Okay, um, so tomorrow before class, you're going to want to preheat your oven to the highest temperature that it can get. So whether that might be 500 degrees, 550 degrees, whatever the highest temperature is, you're gonna to wanna to preheat it for 45 minutes to an hour at least so that it gets really hot and make sure that whatever piece of equipment you're using. So if that's you know, your baking sheet upside down um, or your cast iron pizza upside down or your baking steel or your pizza stone, make sure that's also in the oven 45 minutes to an hour before. So that also preheats. And then the last thing that you're gonna do is also make sure that you take your dough out of the fridge 45 minutes before class starts so that it is able to come to room temperature and you can stretch it out really easily. So oven preheated with equipment inside and then also taking your dough out of the fridge 45 minutes to an hour before. Anything else that needs to be known before tomorrow's class, Karishma? Um, those are the biggest things. And then, you know, we will make sauce together. 
Um, if you if you wanted to make like a meat version of our pizza, it's going to be a margarita style with tomatoes and basil. But if you want to make a meat version, you can pre cook sausage or something like that. Um, or you can also, you know, use like pepperoni. So anything that you want to pre cook, you can and you can add any other toppings as well, like any veggies. Um, just make sure like if it's something like a mushroom, for example, you might want to pre cook it um, just so it has enough time to um, if you're using the large pan, is that enough for one dough ball or two? Uh, is that for balling the dough or for baking it? I think for baking it. Okay. So in order to prepare for tomorrow, if you're using like yeah. the back side of um, a cookie sheet. Yeah. So great question. So we are going to do our pizzas one at a time. So the large sheet is just going to be for like one pizza at a time. Um, it's a little bit tricky to do two at a time. It's easier to do them one at a time. And then that way you can also kind of practice with the first one and really nail it the second time. So as long as you, whatever equipment you're using is at least 12 inches for your pizza to slide onto, you're totally good. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karishma. I'm going to pass it over to Amy for some closing words. And, and again, I'm just going to say thank you to Krishma and thank you to you, Rebecca, for facilitating tonight. This was fantastic. Um, and thank you to everybody attending. 